Yeah, I think I must also express my deepest thanks and appreciation to Klaus and he, your team, Alexander, and also Sadra Foundation. Um, I think we're all indebted to your support. <coughs> um, on the one hand, the Tathagata Garbha doctrine, in some respect, <coughs> has been viewed as the culmination of the Buddha's teachings. Uh, on the other hand, the Pratitasamutpada doctrine has often been eulogized uh, as the quintessence of the teachings of the Buddha. <coughs> so these are the things that I'm supposed to speak. Uh, doctrinally, one of the most significant criticism of the Tathagatagava doctrine dubbed as Datuvada or topical philosophies as opposed to critical philosophy by the two Japanese scholars Shiro Matsumoto and Nori, uh, Noriaki Hakamaya, if to put it simplistically, is that the Tathagata Gaba doctrine is un-Buddhist. I think they use un-Buddhist, not non-Buddhist, uh, because it contradicts the Pratita Samutpada principle. This uh, particular criticism made me curious and uh, motivated me to take a closer look at how the 11th century Nyingma scholar Rongzum Chuki Zangbo viewed the Tathagata Gaba doctrine in relation to the Pratit Samutpada doctrine. <coughs> to be sure, Matsumoto and Hakamaya, uh, to be sure, unlike Matsumoto <laughs> and Hakamaya, <laughs> Tibetan scholars, to my knowledge, never interpreted, uh, never interpreted Tathagata Gaba doctrine outright as non-Buddhist. They either interpreted the uh, doctrine found in Indian scriptures and treatises inclusivistically, that is by considering it to be provisional and relegating or subordinating it to the doctrine they consider to be definitive, or they interpret it harmonistically, that is as definitive. With regard to Dolbo Bashara Gesen's or John Anpa's interpretation thereof has certainly been interpreted in an exclusivistic manner as non-Buddhist. On the one hand, it seems methodologically problematic uh, for both traditional and modern scholars to somehow accept the same doctrine found in Indian scriptures and treatises, albeit only inclusivistically, as correct Buddhist teachings and reject the Jonangpa's interpretation thereof as non-Buddhist. One might say that Matsumoto and Hakamaya have been, in this regard at least, consistent. On the other hand, if one considers the overall a role of the Pratit Samutpada doctrine as a principle that explains the manifold world, including, so to speak, the Buddhist karmological and mokshological mechanisms in favor of any kind of theistic or non-theistic metaphysical explanation proposed by non-Buddhist religions and philosophies, one can understand and sympathize with the concerns of the traditional and modern critics of the Tathagatagava doctrine, especially if it or any of its equivalent for that matter is understood as a metaphysical substratum and thus taking place of the very metaphysical cause that early Buddhism in general seems to have sought to reject. It might seem as though the theory of metaphysical cause has been smuggled in through the back door. If this has been the case, one may have to concede that John Ambas cannot be made responsible or culpable, more culpable and more responsible than their Indian predecessors. It seems somehow, sorry, I, I, I'm kind of that, so Susan. It seems somehow unsatisfying uh, to discuss, for instance, Rongzumpas or anybody's understanding of the Tathagata Gava doctrine isolated from its overall spiritual and intellectual projects and dissociated from his positions on a host of other doctrines that are closely related to the Tathagatagava doctrine, such as his positions on what or which scriptures and doctrines have been considered by him to be definitive or provisional, on the basis of what criterion, his position on the Ekayana or Gotra theories, and so on. In other words, it seems, uh, it seems desirable On the one, on, in other words, it seems desirable to properly contextualize 
his position on the Tathagatagaba theory within the broader framework of his preferred positions on Buddhist ontology, epistemology, gnosiology, soteriology, buddhology, psychology, sorry for this term, sententiology, uh, axiology, <laughs> eschatology, and so forth. Obviously, it is beyond the scope of this present paper to make such an attempt. My topic for today is thus confined to a single issue within the domain of Rongzomba's preferred position on Buddhist uh, ontology, namely the coextensity of the dependently arisen phenomenon, phenomena and empty phenomena, or the universality or totality of the principle of contingency professed by the Pratit Samutpada doctrine. The point of departure is the famous Mula Madhima Karika, chapter 22, verse 19, which categorically states, Apritita samutpanno dharma kaschina vidyate, yasma tasma ashunyo hi dharma kaschina vidyate. Kaunchi tenjung mayim bi chuga yuba mayim, but dechit tongba mayim bi chuga yuba mayino. Because there is no phenomenon whatsoever that is not dependent on a reason, there is no phenomenon whatsoever that is not empty. The issue, therefore, is uh, is Pratita Samutpada coextensive, the Tibetan word is kyabnyam, with Tathagata Gava in the sense of an absolute entity or reality, or is there some kind of entity or reality to which the Pratitsampada principle does not apply? For the sake of comparison, let us take a brief look at uh, how Dolbopa, the alpha or archetypical extrinsic entities in Tibet, views the issue of the coextensity of the Tathagata Gava and Pratitsampada. His position had been made clear in his Ruchi Jamso. The, the bold ones are, uh, I think, his position. According to him, <coughs> Nagarjuna, in, uh, Nagarjuna in his Mula Madhima Karika chapter 24, verse 19, does not maintain the coextensity of the dependent arisen phenomena and empty phenomena. The main argument seems to be that only conditioned and conventional phenomena can be contingent on the Pratitsamutpada principle and the absolute non conditioned. Uh, a reality or extrinsic emptiness which transcends the Pratisamutpada principle cannot be contingent on it. Now, what does Rongzompa say on this on the coextensity of the Tathagata Gava and Pratisamutpada? Before I try to answer this question, let me first say a few words about Rongzompa's position on the Tathagata Gava. At least on three earlier occasions, I discussed to some length Rongzompa's interpretation of the Tathagata Gava theory. But one must admit that his actual and main concern has been the ontology posited by the Sarva Dharma Aparishtanavada sub-branch of the Madhyamaka school, as he understands it, which is the theory of the indivisibility of the two modes of reality, or of Svayambhuchnana, and not the Tathagatagava theory by itself and in itself. The Tathagatagava theory becomes of some interest to him only if it turns out to be an expression of the indivisibility of the two modes of reality. Rongzomba clearly states that that which is the pure or purified sphere of reality should be identified as the Tathagata Gava, and as the nature of all phenomena. We can find several ontological statements that Rongzomba makes. Which, uh, which expresses uh, various aspects of Mahayana ontology that he proposed or presupposed, namely, sorry, excuse me for all this list of these philosophies, Mahayana non-essentialism, that is the view that all phenomena are characterized by non-essentiality. Number two, Mahayana non-originationism, that is the view that all phenomena are up initio non-arisen. Mahayana illusionism, that is the view that all phenomena are like illusions. Uh, Mahayana, sorry for this, this strange word, <laughs> Nishprapanchaism or Mahayana non-proliferationism, that is the view that all phenomena are characterized by nothing but the quiescence or cessation of the manifoldness or proliferation. Uh, Mahayana idealism, there is a view that all phenomena are not existent, extraneous to one's mind. And Mahayana primordial pristinism, sorry for this strange word, is that all phenomena are intrinsically and up initio pristine or pure. 
Mahayana intrinsic luminosism, that is the view that not only is the nature of the mind luminous or radiantly pure, uh, but all phenomena are intrinsically luminous. Mahayana non-dualism, the view that all phenomena are undivided or without division. Mahayana primordial awakenism, that is the view that all phenomena are up initio awakened. Mahayana intrinsic nirvanism, that is the view that all phenomena are intrinsically character characterized by cessation or extinction. Mahayana non-apparitionism, sorry, mere apparitionism, that is the view that all phenomena possess nothing but mere characteristics of manifesting to one's to one as a result of one's mental construction. This is such a difficult and uh, important term in Rongzumba's thought. Uh, Mahayana non-foundationalism, I thank David, I, uh, I followed you in using this term. This is the view that all phenomena are abortless, all phenomena are groundless, all phenomena are rootless. To be sure, Rongzumba too, like I would say majority of Buddhists, clearly posits Dependent originationism, that is the Buddhist view that all phenomena are characterized by dependent er er arising or all phenomena are dependently arisen. With regard uh, to all of these 15 various versions or aspects of Mahayana ontology, it seems worth pointing out that for Rongzumba, no, Rongzumba recognized two kinds of Mahayana system, namely the system of indivisibility of the two modes of reality and a system that posits the two separate modes of reality. And although the terms and expressions employed by these two types of Mahayana to characterize these various kinds of ontology may be identical, the referent of these terms as understood by the special and common Mahayana is not identical. Let me repeat here two propositions mentioned above. Namely, one, they, they may seem generically akin to Matsumoto's and Hakamaya's topical Buddhism and the other that is generically akin to the critical Buddhism. The first proposition is the one pertinent to Tibetan version of Hongaku, sorry if I misuse this your word, which I call here Mahayana primordial awakenism, that is the view that all phenomena are up initio awakened. The second proposition is of what I call dependent originationism, that is the view that all phenomena are characterized by dependent arising. When discussing the coextensity and or extensity of the Tathagata or Pratisamutpada doctrine, the word all, as uh, pointed out by Professor Kano, is crucial. But the exegetes, we all know that the exegetes know that all is very context bound, and as in the case of all people have gathered here, like mi kun so, and all medicinal herbs are present, men kun sang. Rongzumpa, as would also most Tibetan uh, Buddhist scholars, clearly identifies all phenomena as all knowable objects, external and internal, conditioned here, remark, uh, notably, conditioned and non-conditioned, those characterized by pollution and purification, defiled and undefiled, all samsaric and nirvanic phenomena. The unambiguity of the expression all phenomena seems particularly important because he distinguishes, as we shall see below, between two kinds of statements, namely categorical and non-categorical. It is clear that for Dolpupa, the main reason why Tathagata cannot be Pratishtamutpada is because Tathagata is non-conditioned, and hence it is not contingent on causes and conditions. But what about Rungzumba's position on this? To be sure, he does not cite and, or comment on Mula Madhima Karika, chapter 24, verse 19 that we have just seen above. But for him, too, uh, seems, uh, 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 seems to have been acute, he seems to have been acutely aware of the issue of the universality or totality of the Pratitsamutpada principle for from a, from a related but a different angle, namely from the perspective of Mahayana illusionism. While there is no difficulty in maintaining that all conditioned phenomena are illusory or illusion-like, and thus also dependent a reason, how can non-conditioned phenomena be illusory or dependent a reason? Both extrinsic and intrinsic emptyists, following the Madhyamaka Karika, chapter 13, verse 1, accepts that, that conditionality, contingency, and illusoriness imply deceptiveness, and thus for both, uh, what is absolute cannot be illusory and deceptive. 
for extrinsic MTEs such as Dorbapa, Tathagata Gava, or any other entity or reality that is characterized by perfect, sorry, this again strange words, perfection of purity, perfection of felicity, eternity, and aseity cannot be illusory. But what about the intrinsic M for <coughs> intrinsic empty such as Rongzumpa? Rongzumpa has been aware uh, has been aware of the two kinds of scriptural statements regarding the idea that all phenomena are illusory and thus by implication also depend on a reason, <coughs> namely a categorical statement that technical. Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, the he has been aware of two kinds of statement. One is called the categorical statement that technical Tibetan term is Chavangyevitsik, which permits no exception or qualification, and non-categorical statement Sik Hangmachen, which permits some exception or subsequent qualification. So, so it's too early. The, fam the first famous categorical statement is the one that posits that should there be a phenomenon more sublime or transcendental than Nirvana itself, even that should be considered illusory. Rongzumpa explicitly alludes to this idea which is found in the Ashta Sahasrika and cited by Chandrakirti in his Prasanapada and Yukti Shastrika Vritti to name but a few examples of Indian sources. The second categorical uh, statement is that one that posits that not only samsara character, characterized by pollution but also nirvana characterized, characterized by purification or bodhi is illusory. The locus classicus for, the, for this idea seems to be Maya Jala Tantra, which has been alluded to Rongzumba on three occasions. Thus, for Rongzumba, there is nothing that can be regarded as existent and yet not illusion-like. And also, Bodhi or Nirvana, or even entity or reality that is even more transcendental than Bodhi and Nirvana, uh, if we regard it to be existent, must, without exception, be illusory. Does Rongzumba not if revoke the unequivocality of Mahayana illusionism and thus also the universality and the tot totality of principle of uh, contingency. Does he not concede that all phenomena are illusory, uh, but nirvana is free from illusoriness? Indeed, this is precisely what he does. He revokes the sweeping and categorical proposition, but we will ask, is this precisely not what Dolpapa uh, uh, does? Indeed, for Dolpapa, absolute non-conditioned metaphysical ground called the Tathagata Gava and the non-conditioned soterical soter soter goal called Nirvana or Nirodya Satya cannot be illusory and deceptive and thus also not contingent on the Pratisamutpada principle. Prima fisse, it would seem that Rongzompa and Dolpapa converge here, but a closer examination reveals that the two cannot be more divergent. For Dolpapa, Nirvana or Tathagata Gava cannot be illusory because of, as I mentioned above, because of its purity, felicity, non-conditionality, or eternity and aseity. By contrast, for Rongzomba, Nirvana, if it can be regarded as a reference of the designation or convention existent, is, like any other phenomena, illusory. But if one speaks of Nirvana from its own nature, it, again like any other entity or reality, has no basis of characterization for establishing the illusion-like characteristics. And thus, one cannot characterize nirvana as illusory, just as if to employ a popular Indian analogy that Rongzumba, however, doesn't use in this context, a son of a barren woman cannot be characterized as handsome or ugly. So, it turns out to be that for Rongzumba, if the statement that nirvana or bodhi is illusory and contingent on the pratita samutpata principle is retractable, it is not because nirvana or bodhi turns out to have a realer or a better ontological status, as it would be the case for Dolbapa. But because nirvana and bodhi, if examined from the perspective of its own nature, turns out to be devoid of its own nature, or as he calls it, devoid of attainment or possession of own nature. Atma, uh, no, atma Laba or Dangitopa, uh, which is by the way also used by Chandrakirti in his Prasanapada and so on. But this, uh, but is this lack of Atma Laba confined only to Nirvana and Bodhi? This is certainly not the case for him. For him, it is, uh, it is applicable to both samsaric phenomena, uh, samsaric and Nirvanic phenomena, but, uh, uh, samsaric phenomena characterized by pollution and Nirvanic phenomena characterized by purification. This is for him, there is for him no difference whatsoever 
in the ontological status of the samsaric and nirvanic phenomena. By way of comparison, it is interesting to note that Longchen Bajimiyo speaks of three kinds of Pratitya in his Shinta Chembo, the auto commentary on the Seming Elso, namely Pratitya Samutpada of reality, Pratitya Samutpada of samsara, Pratitya Samutpada of nirvana. Uh, I'm not sure if Longchen Ba has been the first Tibetan scholar to employ such a typology of three kinds of Pratitya Samutpada, but it has been emulated by other Tibetan scholars such as Kuntu Lodi Thai. Uh, the typology of two kinds of Pratitya Samutpada, namely Samsaric Pratit Samutpada and Nirvanic Samutpada has already been used, however, by several Kagyu masters, like Dugung uh, Kagyu masters and uh, Karma Baranju Dorji and so on, starting from Gombo Vasanam Rinchen. Whether or not it, it is he who introduced the terminology Pratit Samutpada of reality, Longchen refers to Mula Karika, chapter 24, verse 18, which identifies Pratit Samutpada with Shunyata. According to Dogoba, as we have seen above, the kind of shunyata identified with Pratishamutpada is intrinsic emptiness and not his extrinsic emptiness or Tathagata Gava. A possible motivation or motive for introducing the terminology Pratishamutpada of reality may have been a wish to solve the difficulty posed by the coextensity of the principle of contingency and reality. So something has gone wrong here. Okay. Um, one cannot deny that already in Indian sources, we see Pratisamutpada explained in two different ways. Namely, as in Mula Madhimukarika chapter 28, verse 18, 24, verse 8, 18, which identifies Pratisamutpada as Shunyata, and also and the one as we find in Chandakirti's Mula Madhimukarika, that is uh, chapter uh, 6, verse 204 AB. Uh, I don't have access to this aspect yet. Uh, according to which Pratisamutpada has been the uh, characteristic of interaction, Dutri Of the two aspects of the Pratisamutpada, one pertains to the mode of existence, or what I would like to say, trans slash ultra phenomenal reality, and one to the mode of appearance, that is what I would like to call cis phenomenal reality. This is precisely uh, how already some Indian scholars, such as Avalokita Vrata, have viewed the matter, uh, who in his Pranayapradipa Tika clearly speaks of absolute Pratisamutpada and conventional Pratisamutpada. This is true also for several Tibetan scholars who refer to these two kinds of Pratisamutpada as absolute and conventional Pratisamutpada. The question now is how these two aspects of Pratisamutpada or modes of Pratisamutpada related to each other. The kind of relation between these two modes will naturally depend on the kind of model of truth or reality presupposed by any given system, scholar, or school, source. That is, if we, for example, presuppose the Yogacara or Tathagata Gava school's model of reality or truth, there seems to be no problem for considering an existing entity or reality to be absolute and hence not governed by the Pratisamutpada principle. But if we presuppose Nagarjuna's model of truth or reality, or Pratisamutpada in the sense of emptiness and Pratisamutpada in the sense of causal conditional interaction, are merely two facets of the one and same true reality, which Rongzompa calls the indivisibility of the two modes of reality. This is obviously also the case with Nagarjuna and Chandakirti, who seem to agree in maintaining that the phenomena which apparently arises is actually never a reason, it's a non-arisen. Based on such an idea, a late uh, Nyingma scholar Mipham states that the co-equality of apparent arising and the actual non-arising can be seen seen as one to the middle way. Ronsompa does not speak of the absolute Patisamutpada and conventional Patisamutpada. Uh, sorry, this was also right. Sorry, this is a bit late. Ronsompa does not speak of the absolute Patisamutpada and conventional Patisamutpada. For him, the doctrine of Patisamutpada is shared by all Buddhist systems or schools. But there is a difference in the subtlety. The doctrine of Pratishnamutpada as accepted by common Buddhist vehicles is able to eliminate the superimposition and deprecation, extremes of eternalism and annihilationism or nihilism regarding causes and effects, but not with regard to the true nature of the phenomena. The system, this system, 
uh, that is common Mahayana and common Buddhist vehicle hold wrongly these causes and conditions to have their own nature. The special Mahayana, however, realizes that neither the cause, nor the conditions, nor the effects that are involved in the mechanism and dynamism of Pratisamutpada, nor the Pratisamutpada have their own Svabhava. There's no Svabhava. The apparent causes, conditions, and effects involved in the mechanism and dynamism of the Pratisamutpada principle are no actual causes, conditions, and effects. The apparent Pratisamutpanna is the actual Svabhavam Adi Anutpannam. So if to sort of it is, so to speak, apparent pratisamutpanna is equal to actual anutpanna. This seems to be precisely what Navarjuna is trying to convey via, for example, uh, five, okay. uh, Yukti Shastika uh, 48 and Mula Madhimikarika chapter 7, verse 16. Navarjuna and Rongzompa are not denying the apparent causes, conditions, and effects involved in the pratisamutpanna mechanism, but maintaining that those that apparently arise apparently continue to arise, continue to exist, and cease never actually arise. They never continue to exist, and they never cease. The philosophical idea that dependent arising is empty of dependent arising, that we find in Pranyaparamita scriptures, such as the uh, Panchabhimshatika uh, Sahasrika, seems to have been pursued to the utmost rigor and consistency. This is, this is also precisely what Navarjuna does in his first chapter of the Mula Madhikarika dealing with analysis of conditions. Particularly when he states that the famous Pratisamutpada formula, if this exists, that arises, is not tenable. According to Mula Madhikarika chapter eight, uh, 18, verse 10, if X exists, Y arises, is not yet the true reality. Navarjuna suggests that apparent origination and disintegration is just like the apparent origination and disintegration of mirage water, which operates according to the principle of Pratisamapada, is seen through a disorientation and confusion. Similarly for Rongzompa, all appearances, be they samsarik or nirvana, pure or impure, be they be induced by wholesome or unwholesome impressions, are all deceptive. So for him, illusions are seen only through delusions. By way of uh, conclusion, a few remarks may be made. Dolbapa, for Dolbapa, samsaric and nirvanic entities or realities have different ontological status. While conditioned samsaric phenomena characterized pollution are by definition pratisamutpada and illusory, non-conditioned nirvanic phenomena characterized by purification, such as the Tathagata Gaba, are neither pratisamutpada nor illusory. For Rosumpa, however, no difference can be made with regard to the ontological status of samsaric and nirvanic conditioned and non-conditioned phenomena which are equally and indiscriminately illusory as long as they can be considered existent. The fact that an entity or reality or non, is non-conditioned does not render it immune to Madhyamic deconstructional analysis. Even Pratisamutpada, Shunyata or Tathagata Gav, if put to test, would not withstand the test. And hence, the idea that dependent arising is empty of dependent arising. Emptiness of emptiness is empty of the emptiness of empty. <laughs> even the idea that the Tathagata Gava is empty of Tathagata Gava, so we can even reconstruct Tathagata Gava, Tathagata Garvena Shunya, yeah? uh, though I have never seen this formulated in anywhere by anybody, is in, <laughs> <laughs> is in principle acceptable to Rongzumpa. Insofar as he clearly also demonstrate, deconstruct Svayambu Chinyana equated with Tathagata Gava. In his theory of the indivisibility of the two modes of reality constitutes the idea that the virtual Pratisamutpada and actual Anutpana are in fact synonymous. Examining how Rongzompa and Dolbupa view the issue of coextensity of reality and Pratisamutpada contingency, we notice that they follow different models of Mahayana ontology. Perhaps we can state that the thoughts of these two figures represent the two ways of understanding the middle way that Eric Fravanna insightfully pointed out in his philosophy of Buddhism, namely one found in Nagarjuna's work and the other found in the Buddhist of the Bhumi ascribed to Asanga by the Tibetan tradition. It is clear that Dolpapa's model of ontology is rooted in the positive mystical or cataphatic Maitreya Asanga tradition uh, uh, and Rongzompa's on the negative intellectualist or apophatic Manjushri Nagarjuna, as I adopted from Taksang Lotsawa, Manjushri Nagarjuna tradition of Mahayana. Mivam has sought to, re for instance, reconcile the ontological positions of Dolbapa and Tsongkhapa by pointing out that 
even Dolpapa accepted the view of manifoldlessness, that is Chodal or Nishpapancha, and even Songhapa accepted the unity of emptiness and dependent arising. One possible point of convergence on the issue of the ontology between Maitreya Asanga tradition represented by Dolbapa and the Manjushri Nagarjuna tradition represented by Rongzompa uh, seems to be the ontology of non-foundationalism. It is true. It is a sign that I stop. Yeah, but I will finish. This is the last. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, one possible point of convergence on the issue of ontology between the Maitreya Asanga tradition represented by Dolpapa and the Manjushri Nagarjuna tradition represented by Rongzompa seems to be the ontology of non-foundationalism. It is true that the Ratnagodha Vibhaga ascribed to Asanga by the Tibetan tradition indeed posits that the primordial element, that is Anadi Kaliko Dhatu, is the substratum of all phenomena. And yet, Nagarjuna's Yukti Shastika, for example, verse 26, and Ratnagodha Vibhaga, chapter 1, verse 55 to 57, seem to precisely teach the core philosophy of the Sarvadharma Aparishnavada, namely, that although the purity of mind is a substratum of all phenomena, it, it itself is without any substratum. It is also corroborated by uh, Ratnagodha Vibhaga, Vibhaga Vyakya, which unequivocally states that all phenomena are those whose roots have been cut off and those who possess hollow roots, and those who, put, those who possess rootless roots. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. for this refreshing dose of emptiness. And uh, we should have listened to your talk in the beginning, because Kempo Shumi Katsua always said, Lan Kong is the basis of Shen Long <laughs> Anyway, there are questions. And yeah. you mentioned the Mundu Yomaka part of 1810 as like uh, somehow insufficient, um, this particular summer father was insufficient for thinking this. But uh, I don't remember that whole quote. So, what, what is the context for that? Uh, In, uh, maybe the word insufficient is a bit insufficient. <laughs> I, what, if I remember correctly, I think the idea is that, for example, this typical formula of Pratisamutpada, right? if X exists, if X exists, Y arises, and so on. And he said, this is uh, untenable, he said. And, and, and in another instance, he says, this is not yet a reality. The regic deni mean like, dekonani mean, it's not the ultimate reality. So the whole idea, I mean, such a, I, such a con understanding is based on the fact that that which apparently arises out of the, on the basis of Pratyat Samutpada actually never arise. This is the idea, so, and these are all one. Kanji kele kepa de make, that's what it says. Which arises out of cause and condition do not arise. So he's trying to, he's trying to bring them in one line. Yeah? I think this is the, exactly the point, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, um, thank you, George. That was a very interesting talk. Um, I was a bit unclear on one point. Were you saying that Ramazonka was um, looking, seeing the equivalence of Shunyata and Pratita Samutpada in 2418 as conventional Pratita Samutpada or absolute Pratita uh -huh. Now, uh, what was 18 say? <laughs> <laughs> Is Shunyata? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, if I understand correctly, of course I have to qualify. <laughs> if I understand correctly, so uh, when he says uh, that which arises on the basis of is no pratisamutpada is actually is shunyata. I mean this is the idea, and uh, he often uses the analogy of mirage water. So in a mirage water, I think what's exactly what he's saying is. Of course, we see the, the mirage water arising, existing, and ceasing, but this doesn't really take place. So, so you can see with the mirage water, if you see the mirage aspect, you say, okay, this is Chandrakirti's Tenjun uh, Jajun uh, but then it duty senido. So this is the interaction. It looks like an interaction of causes. But Rongzumpa, I mean, Nagarjuna in this verse is saying from the other side, when it, even when it arises, actually this is, so therefore it's always, uh, always uh, empty. So even when we see the Pratisamutpada, actually 
it exists as empty. So this is how he seems to have understood. Okay, so this would be sort of the conventional Pratimutpada. Yeah, one aspect is Pratimutpada and the other, pers uh, but for him is always one. This is the problem. Right, right. <laughs> but in 2418, he would be seeing both? Uh, maybe you can say seeing from one aspect, from one side, like because okay. there are two facets. Okay, mm -hmm. and so the one aspect would be, in 2418, would be the conventional yeah. side with the illusion. Yeah. Okay. So one from this side and one from the other side, but they always are one and so on. Right. Okay. But well, interesting thing is, I said, uh, for, uh, for him, only we can see the illusions only as in so far as we have delusions. When the, our delusions gone, we also don't see illusions. Okay. So that is the uh, Dharma Datu Vishuddhi Matra for him. That is the pure, total Dharma Datu. <laughs> Yeah. The one place Equate. <laughs> in, in the entire Mulamagana character true. where we do find the Seems Shichit Samat, Samat Pari equated yes, with yes, Shiva yes. and Nirvana. Yes. But yes. we don't, because it's, that's the only place in the yes, world, yes. we don't know 100% of the Mangalishwara was right. So that. based on your uh, research, I, I had in my previous one of the drafts, I took it out because if this is, we are not even sure whether it's by Navarjuna, so I thought maybe let's keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, I, do, I don't uh -huh. think so. Yeah. Okay. But uh, this, uh, the distinction of two kinds of Pratisamutpada, this, I was very happy to find that uh, this in one Indian comment where he explicitly used the word Kunzoki uh, ten, ten, Tendril and Dandamgi Tendril. I think Avaloki, uh, what do you call that? Uh, Pranyapadipa Tika by Avaloki Tavrata. <laughs> occasioned by your, your wonderful use of English neologism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I use um, the word ontology when I talk about Buddha nature discourse, and, but over the course of the past couple of days I've been wondering if <laughs> that's not the best term to use, and what if we think of it as phenomenology, as something that's more closely tied to the experience of an individual living being? Okay, so that's one question. Um, and then um, the larger question is, and I don't mean this rhetorically at all, um, what is the value, from your perspective, as someone who works in multiple philosophical worlds, of using heavily loaded terms like that to name styles of philosophy? Mm -hmm. Such as when you use ontology, when you use phenomenology, you're talking to, you're, you're referring implicitly to specific, histories and, and modes of thinking about philosophy? Um, no, I forgot the first question. <laughs> <laughs> was, was, okay, so we think about it as talking about being, right? Uh -uh. What, and so ontology. But what if we think about the future as talking about phenomenology, the experience of being from the perspective of a, of a, of a living individual? Yeah, I was. I must say that yeah, it's such a difficult thing. I, uh, I was uh, torn. I once went to a conference full of like, Catholic scholars, theologians, and whenever I, also sinologists, Buddhologists, whenever I use some English word, they say, no, this is not okay, this is not. So, so am I supposed to use only Tibetan and Sanskrit? But then my audience, the way I try to think and interact are uh, either English speaking or uh, Europe, like let us say Western languages. So therefore, I, uh, I am aware of the difficulties because I know that uh, if you say ontology, some people always think ontology as a sort of a positive, always imply that there is some sort of a positive entity when I say ontology and say, okay, Madhyamaka has no ontology and so on. Yeah? The Yogacara has no ontology and so on. But what I'm thinking is like, actually I'm influenced by the term used in uh, Bodhisattva Bhumi where, it's, where it says that actually it's a kind of a theory of reality. Uh, what is there really? Because if you just take a little word, being, of course, Buddhist sources are full of references to what is there, what is being. So, nilu, so if I use the Tibetan word, I say Nelugrupa would be the word. Uh, but then, of course, I cannot use Nelugrupa and people not understand. So in the end, I thought maybe I should sometimes try to use words, coin myself and define myself. Because if I use any existing term, I, got, I get like... like 
uh, bank, so to, so to speak. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I know this problem. I know it's kind of full of uh, <laughs> implications, undesirable associations, and so on. These are the limitations of the language. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm experimenting. I know that it's uh, full of problems. <laughs> so I use Nishprapanchaism, for instance. So if people don't understand, ask me. I'm going to explain. Uh, and if I use the word non-proliferation, okay, it's not a nuclear thing, and so on. So, so, <laughs> so what is it? Okay, then it's Nishprapanchaism. And then what is Nishprapanchaism? Okay, ask me. I'm going to explain. Yeah? So these are one of the kind of a way to get away from the problem. <laughs> Sorry for this. <laughs> well, what wonders me, uh, does Ram Sampa uh, try to explain in the passages in the Rana Gota Vibhaga or in the Kadarava Sutras, you know, which uh, are against this equation or inclusion of everything? Uh, yeah, as I said, I tried to write on the two, three previous articles, uh, not so much, but a little bit more. And, uh, it is really, it became clear to me that he doesn't know uh, Ratnagot Vivaga in his commentary. So his information, but he suddenly knew all the, let us say, literature or, uh, dealing with, I mean, the earlier uh, literature dealing with the sutras and so on. But what is, what, is, uh, uh, what is noticeable is that he does not really use the word Tathagata Gava unless he is forced to, uh, uh, he is forced for example, in the Guiha uh, Garba Tantra has Sugata Garba. So in this case, he has no other choice. He has to say something. But I, my impression is that for him, Rangjung Yishi, the Svayam Buchinya, is more important. So in many years ago, I said that uh, he, interprets the, he interprets the Tathagata Garba if he has to in the light of Rangjung Yishi, and never vice versa. But for Dolpapa, it would be the reverse. So for Dolpapa also Rangjung Yishi is so important and the Deshi is very important, but there is a marked difference on the, the focus, I have a feeling. So this is also one reason why I always try to, because Dolpapa for me is a very interesting reference point to see uh, how, how other people think in relation to Dolpapa. Well, the idea is something similar, which yeah, is of course. the uh, of course. Uh, point of reference. Yes. Uh, I use as alpha uh, alpha uh, shantongpa is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the big dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, some more questions? Or? Yeah, well, I just thought I'd mention um, he does use the term Namchuk Ningpo a lot. Yes. And uh, it led me to ask you at some point whether he indeed did know of the Ratnagotra Vipaga because he lived at the time of the Tisha who he met with. And the Tisha was one of the translators of that text, but he also lived at the time when Nobu and Jira was making his translation. But it seems he simply didn't know of it. And, uh, and in this early period of Book 10, the preferred term was Jung Chu Mingpo. So in his Uyagarva commentary, Ram Song says, well, this term, Sugata Garba, quote unquote, um, refers to a seed that you have to make right in through causes and conditions. But we use the term Jung Chu Mingpo uh, or Jung Chu Samji Mingpo. Yeah. This is interesting because they, in a way, saw that um, standard Buddha nature idea was a little bit, shall we say, like super. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I did give some thoughts on this, the use of the word Jiangchun Yingpo, because in the, if you read, uh, I think, Jinya Alankara Aloka or Vimala Kiptinitesha Sutra, uh, uh, of course, we know that Jiangchun Yingpo is a physical place, location, not a metaphysical place. No? Well, it but yeah, 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 exactly. So Bodhimanda is usually the door, seat where the Buddha got yeah. awakened. It's a physical play. But I have a, really a feeling that some Mahayana Sutras already started to use this uh, concept of Jiangchen Yingpo no longer in a, or not only or no longer in, in a, as a physical spot, but a kind of a ontological or metaphysical kind of a reality. And of course, before we do see in peop later on, but whether this such an such an understanding can be found in Indian uh, uh, sources or not, but I have a suspicion that, for example, uh, Vimala Kitinidesha or Chinyana Alankara Alok, they do use this Jamchuk Nyingpo, and I think this is no longer physical. I have a feeling that it's even metaphysical. I think that means that literally and and um, and uh, met metaphor. I mean, there's a literal and, and figurative sense of Bodhimanda, which means the seat of awakening. But there are also passages where it's the Buddha aspires to. Bodhi 
Ananda not just to go to Bodhaya, but to actually reach awakening? So in German, the naliegen, no? because the seat of Bodhi is here, so that's what it is within me. <laughs> that is Buddha nature. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah, we have to conclude. Thank you. Yes, thank you.